Welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Suzanne Harris, and my listeners get the story behind every book. Joining me today is one of my favorite kind of authors. His name is Kurt Mailman, and he's here to talk about his book, Swoosh. Kurt's story is a story that I think many of you will identify with. He has been in the construction industry for more than 40 years in Chicago. He started writing about 25 years ago, but he's just recently decided to publish his work and share it with the rest of us. His writing focuses on young readers, and he pulls those readers into the stories with humor, intrigue, surprises. And his characters are both real, believable, as well as magical. Kurt, it is such a pleasure to welcome you to Books on Air. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you. You know, I have questions. Authors start writing for a variety of reasons. Uh, Sometimes they read as a child, and somebody that they read like a Bronte sister or um, one of the major authors influenced them in some way, or they have a, a relative or a parent that somehow is a writer, and they emulate that parent or or relative. Sometimes it's a teacher. Sometimes a teacher will make an assignment to a student, and the student turns in something that's extraordinary, the teacher recognizes it, and they encourage the person to begin writing. The thing I'm curious about is what got your attention about writing? What made you want to start writing, and how old were you? Well, probably started in second grade when... I wrote a report on Abraham Lincoln, and for some strange reason, everybody liked it. And I don't know if it was the vocabulary or it was it was the way it was, but um, and you know how you know when you get adults start to comment about what you've done on paper, it's like, wow, this is really wild, and that that has stayed with me for since then. the influence of my father probably because he was a musician and he wrote music. And so there may have been some, um, some influence there. And uh, certainly in middle school, I started reading a whole series of books by Jim Kierkegaard um, uh, about a boy and his dog and, and, you know, all that type of genre. And um, that certainly, uh, uh, influenced me in terms of writing at this age and uh, wanting to um, pursue this uh, this particular uh, activity that I that I enjoy and and of course I enjoy reading so that that also plays into it. Natural segue. Yet yeah, it sounds like your father, the creative genes were already sown because of his writing music. I think that's really interesting. What's the backstory? behind swoosh now we pronounce it slightly differently and i think it's because you're in illinois and i'm in texas so we have a little bit of a different accent but s-w-o-o-s-h what's the backstory where did this book the first one in the series come from this came as an inspiration at like three in the morning uh, some years ago, probably by now, I think it was probably four years ago, as I was looking to express a way that would be interesting for for a young young person to read. So I knew I needed a medium, which of course is um, the tele- tel- 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 telepathy between uh, uh, the two two main characters, the little boy and the bat. And it just popped in my head, this is what we'll have them do. And, of course, when somebody reads the book, they'll notice that the type is different from normal discussion and between uh, the young boy and the bat. It's always in italics, which is to indicate to the reader that this is this is happening inside their head. This is nothing spoken. So 
that's what is the special talent that um, they both have. This is so much fun. I've read the first part of the book. From the first sentence, you reach out, literally, and grab the reader and pull the reader in. I was sad when the first part of that book that I was able to read came to an end. I wanted to know what happened. Let's give our listeners a little overview of what this first book in the Swoosh series is about. Okay, so the first book is, of course, the introduction of of the little boy and hit the exposure that he has his special talent. Um, and then the main focus of this whole book is public speaking. And as we all know, when we're kids, whether it's in grade school or middle school or whatever, any time public speaking is one of those number one fears that people have. And this kind of, this, this book leads that process through, which I think most of us can all identify as to when we first were in a class and giving a book report. So that's the, that's the overall arching moment, uh, momentum as to the presentation of what the young boy is researching in order to save, uh, save the animals. This really basically came from an experience that you had when you were young with bats. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it's, um, my family is so surprised I'm writing with bats because I have a, um, um, a real um, fear of bats because <laughs> we had bats in our house. And um, we, you know, luckily we had Siamese cats and they were great batters. <laughs> And, and during the night, uh, hot summer nights in Iowa, uh, we had an old brick house, and so the bats could get through, and our cats would just knock them down. And um, um, But we would hear the bats flying through the bedrooms, and we'd hear the cat following the bat. And uh, that particular experience really gave me a uh, an intense fear of bats, which is so ironical that I'm now writing about how a bat is helping, aiding, saving, educating, uh, teaching this young boy. Yeah, this is a friendly bat. <laughs> this is a oh, yeah. This is, this is this a good is a guy good bat. bat. Yes. I, I, I am so surprised to hear you tell that story. When I read, I, of course, I do my research whenever I'm going to interview an author. And it, the the research that I read said just some benign sentence about uh, experiences with a bat as a child. And I thought, oh, well, he must have had a, a positive experience, blah, blah, blah. I'm so <laughs> shocked to hear you yeah. tell this story. And that does make me go, wow, because the bat character is really, I, I really like the bat character. That's so clever. Now, not Thank only, you. not only have you created a story that has that magical, fun imagination quality about it, because you start out in the dark of night where, of course, you should, but there are lessons that you gently put forth in the the story. What are some of the lessons that you really are trying to get across to young children in a very gentle way? Well, I, I, as I write these books, there's like an overarching motivation, which is hopefully parent and child, you know, will talk about the book and how their reactions to what is happening to the to the young boy and how they would react. Um, but other lessons that are learned is uh, stuff like, hey, book reports can be fun. You know, if you want to talk about something very tangible, very, very real, that that particular lesson in this book can be used uh, by anybody at any grade in order to put together a book report if you follow the the, the activity that uh, the young boy goes through in developing that. Uh, other lessons are 
uh, abbreviations work in terms of uh, making sure that you get the message, like uh, what the mo- how the mother or the mom uh, abbreviates things, and we all have that in, in our households. So, again, trying to create a common bond between whoever the reader may be and and their experience and what is happening in this particular book's experience. Um, certainly there's an ecological or environmental twist to this in the sense of, hey, you know, bats are not endangered, but they are something that are really very important, you know, to our lives in terms of the pollination and what they do and, and the other elements of, of a particular uh, of that species. And uh, so there are those type of lessons. And, and there are other lessons that can be pulled out depending on the chapter um, as a reader moves through it. And certainly the other lesson would be that they can expand upon what's, what's uh, presented in, in the various chapters. You know, as a former educator, I'm a former English teacher, and whenever I see a book like this, it it really just makes my brain set on fire with all the different things that an educator could do with a book like this, because obviously a biology teacher could use this, or to teach biology to the younger kids, you could bring in the idea of bats, you could even work with a local zoo or a local, we have a a museum here in in, uh, Texas that they have live animals and so the the kids can go to the museum have a a field trip to the museum and then they bring out some of the live animals i don't know if they have bats or not but using an organization like that would give the kids the different a different idea and a different view of what bats really are some may have the same kind of fear that you did when you were a kid it just makes my my brain explode you know they could do all kinds of research ecological research One of the big lessons that I took away from this was that one person can make a difference. And I think this this young reader, this young person that you have, the young boy in this story, we see him grow from a kid who's just kind of, what do you mean? I can't make a difference. I can't do anything. I don't even know what a colony is, to taking this and taking hold of it and realizing that he can make a difference and that he can change things. And I also think the way you've written the book is a real fire for the imagination for the kid. And whenever I'm looking at books like this, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that it provides this astonishing bonding moment for families and for children. If a parent or a guardian or a sibling sits down with a younger child and they begin to read the book and they read perhaps a chapter at a time and they talk about it or they talk about it at the dinner table or you have a grandparent that sits and reads or even the child reading the book themselves, It provides thought moments, and I think that's really, really important. You did such a great job with that. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'm sure that— And thank you for pointing out—thank you for—pardon me for interrupting, but thank you for pointing out one of the main main points I tried (laughs) to—I did try to um, uh, press, and that is, you know— you know, if you set your mind to something, you can make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my job. I pick that stuff up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good, good point. Let's talk about the target age group before we tell people where they can find the book. Who did you have in mind? What age group did you have in mind? Well, typically I was thinking in the 10 to 14, but then I dropped it down to 6. It may be a little, I don't know what, too simplistic for the, today's crowd, the young teenagers. Uh, th- there's a certain market niche in in that early teens that might find this intriguing, but uh, I would say I'd probably drop it down more to six. Some of the some of the vocabulary in there is pretty challenging, and of course, uh, I you know I did that on purpose so that maybe. If somebody's reading this, they're going to go, oh, I don't understand what this word is. or, Good. And, and you know, again, trying to bring, you know, different generations together and stuff like that. But uh, that, that's kind of like my, my uh, 
that would be my market focus right now in terms of age group. And I, I think boys and girls are, are would be either would would enjoy it. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you drew me in right away. I was captivated by the idea. And it's one of those books that once you pick up and start to read it, it's almost like the page pages turn themselves because you want to know what happens next, what happens next, what happens next. And I think that that's really, really valuable. Let's tell our listeners where they can find the book. Now, it is on Amazon, and let me do some spelling and uh, let you know how you can find it. If you've never been to Amazon, all you have to do is type that word in your search feature, www.amazon.com, and click on it, and you'll go right to that website. I mean, it's almost like your computer will take you there before you have to click on it. You'll see a big search box. There's sort of a blank kind of a gray, long, rectangular box. The title of the book is Swoosh, S-W-O-O-S-H, by Kurt, K-U-R-T, Mailman, M-O-E-H-L-M-A-N-N. Put that in the search feature, click on it, and the book will come right up. Now, you'll be able to buy it right there. It's a Kindle. You can buy a paperback. You can buy a hardback. I know that some of our listeners perhaps don't want to buy books from Amazon because they are the major marketplace for books. Some people like to give somebody else a chance to sell them a book. Where else, Kurt, could they find it? Uh, They can find it at Barnes & Noble and also from Balboa Press. Now, do you have a website? Uh, I do have a website. It's www.kurtmailman.com. Just like my spelling of my name, K-U-R-T-M-O, no space, M-O-E-H-L-M-A-N-N.com. If I go to your website, what will I find there? I don't know. You may not find anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a... I'm not a real big website guy, but I know I got one. I uh, I have to start putting some content on there. <laughs> I'm sure you just sucked right everybody everybody right into that website, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love it. Now, yeah, that'll crash the internet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. All right, I know you're on Facebook, and I know you're on LinkedIn. If they want to find you on either one of those two sites, should they just use your name? Yes, just type in my name. And don't expect to find any content once you get to the page. Is that it? (laughs) Well, no, those two, you will find content. Great. You'll find find stuff like uh, links to various organizations, uh, links to my uh, Over the Hill Gang swim team, and uh, on LinkedIn, you'll find you'll find all sorts of content about construction because that's what I use in uh, in my uh, regular business. So this will really give our our listeners a, an insight into who you are, basically. Yeah, yeah, they they may see some interesting pictures. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the series now. The book that we really talked about today is actually, for all intents and purposes, Swoosh One. Tell me what's next in the series and how many books you have so far. Okay. So Swish 1 and Swish 2 are both published. Swish 2 is about uh, a very common and very visible problem in school that happens between young uh, young boys. And um, it's a topic that um, I'll, just, I'll just say right now, it's, it's all about bullying. Mm. Uh, what happens with a bully? And Swoosh, uh, Swoosh 3 is currently uh, at the publisher. Uh, we're, we're going through edits. And that one's uh, a little more risky in terms of subject matter in that uh, the young boy's best friend has a home life that is very disruptive and uh, I can say abusive. And it kind of follows the line of, if you see something, say something. And then Swish 4 and 5 are currently 
uh, at home. Uh, Switch five is uh, Switch four is more about a common day problem that we all face. Switch five is more fantastical, and it kind of goes into the history of how these guys communicate. These two people communicate, and it takes it it, it takes the reader um, into fantasy land uh, with some very commonly uh, named persons that we know about. Uh, certainly mythical people, but it's more fanciful in that respect. Um, and then six and seven and eight uh, will probably return to more of the format that one, two, and three return to. But uh, those are still in the um, in the gray matter uh, yet to be formulated. I love it. You know, th- the fact that you have already imagined eight books for this series and completed about half of them, I think is absolutely terrific. Is the the young boy and the bat are the characters that run through all of the books, and we've been very careful not to name either one because that doesn't happen in the book until the very last page. So I didn't want to ruin that surprise. Thank you. And, yes, they are the... They are the the two main characters through the whole series, yes. Excellent. Now I've got one more question for you about Swoosh One. Every author is passionate about their work, and you certainly are, are passionate about what you've done with this book. When the parent and the child or the grandparent and the child or whoever the child is reading the book with or even if they're reading it by themselves, whenever they get to that last page and they find out who that main, those two main characters are and they close the back cover for the very last time, what is the main message that you want them to take away from Swoosh? Well, there's probably several. One is, please buy Squish 2. <laughs> <laughs> but I suppose, I suppose seriously, it's it's probably the one that you probably mentioned before, and that is you can make a difference. And don't don't let people get in your way when you're when you have an idea. And uh, as a no matter what your age is, no matter no matter what your circumstances are. I think you pretty well nailed that. Uh, that's probably the the one thing I want them to to take away. Um, I, I just uh, I just think that's an important lesson that we all need to learn and all need to remember. Um, and sadly, as we as we mature, that's one of those lessons that we 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 don't we don't recover. We don't we don't. Uh, we, we we don't believe in ourselves, and we just got to. You know, I couldn't agree with you more. Sometimes you feel like you're just sort of a drip in the ocean because there's there's so much, and you look at what's happening in the world. And, you know, we've all dealt with the pandemic for the last three years, and now the war in the Ukraine. And you sit there and you look at all of these things, and they almost feel like steamrollers. And so you begin to, to believe that, you're just such a small person that you can't make a difference. But even if you start out in a small way, you can make a difference in something or somebody, just like our young hero did with the bat in the book. So I think this is a perfect message for right now. And I cannot wait, Kurt, to talk to you about the next swoosh book because I enjoyed the first one so much. Thank you for being my guest on Books on Air. It's just been a pleasure. Thank you. Now remember you can find Swoosh by Kurt Mailman on Amazon and let me spell his name for you one more time. K-U-R-T M-O-E-H L M-A-N-N all one word. You've been listening to the Books on Air podcast brought to you on webtalkradio.net. You can also hear this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. I'm Suzanne Harris, and I hope you'll join me for our next Books on Air podcast because remember, you never know who's going to be here, and you never know what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much for listening.